No, I, uh, I have observed throughout my, my life, I've been involved in looking for this stuff since 1957. I've seen the hundreds and thousands of prospects, well, not thousands, hundreds of prospects all over the world. And I was trained to be a geologist, and I saw my, my job in those distant days as being like a doctor. I would look at the prospect, yes, it was good. I could feel the pulse and say, yes, it was okay, or this one. No, it doesn't work. We were asked in those old days to express judgment. So we could see what was good and we could see what was bad, what was big and what was small. But those days are long gone. So now we're sort of salesmen trying to sell ideas to drill here for whatever reason, drill there, and most fail. I mean, this is, this is not any miracle. Any simple observation shows that it fails. But finally, now, surprising, that, so there was a chapter of drilling wells everywhere, and one could afford to do it because the taxpayer paid. We were spending 10 cent dollars. I drilled many wells in Norway. Under the Norwegian tax regime, uh, they had very high taxes, which was an enormous blessing. We loved the high taxes because all our costs were written off against them. And um, so this was a very strange environment, but that is now coming to an end thanks to technology because with the very sophisticated technology, it becomes much more difficult to drill a dry hole that means you have fewer and fewer remaining prospects that you can justify drilling. And indeed, the exp in the last few years, the major oil companies are drilling fewer and fewer wells. So this isn't exactly a deliberate policy, but it, in practice, they can, see, they can see much more clearly what they're doing. And it is very difficult to deliberately drill a dry hole. Now, the, the thing is, even, even a fairly small oil field is under quite low oil, at $10 a barrel. This is very, very profitable. Exploration, as I've explained, is written off against tax. Operating costs are also written off against tax. So quite a small oil field is already very profitable under low oil prices. So when oil prices rise, by all means, one can look at extreme situations in some way. One can, in the last oil price boom of the early 80s, in those more primitive technology days, a huge number of wells were drilled. They didn't find any more, but it became viable to drill more dry hole. So um, I would say that, that uh, fairly modest oil prices are sufficient to make a, a good profit, and that, that what the increment, depending on higher prices, makes no real world difference. As far as world exploration is concerned, I would say that the world has now been sufficiently explored for the oil industry to know now all the promising areas. All the big promising areas have been identified. The, the, uh, the, 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 the Caspian was the last uh, great white hope. This was not explored offshore because the, the, the Soviets had no particular need to do so. Then they opened it up to the Western companies, and there were very exaggerated ideas about what the Caspian might hold. And indeed, two or three quite large, nice fields have been found. But now, with hindsight, one can say it's not going to change the world. Contrary to what people sometimes think, the Soviets were, were very efficient explorers because they were spared all of the commercial uh, obstacles to actually doing it. The, the Soviets had drilled wells to get information. It didn't have to pretend that every wildcat was going to be a success. In fact, it was the Soviets who made the breakthrough, the geochemical breakthrough, as to identifying where the stuff was formed uh, in the first place. So I think that the Soviets found most all the prospective basins, except perhaps in the offshore Siberia, which was out of range and still is. But all accessible places have been found, and most of the giant fields within them. You ask about China. China is not a very oily area for geological reasons. And in the 80s, they opened the, the continental shelf to get the Western companies to come in, because the Chinese then didn't have the technology. And it has been a failure. I mean, one or two small finds have been made, but and it's now more or less written off. So. Um, I think the world has now been so thoroughly explored that all the biggest places have been found. Remember that the North Sea is the largest 
the largest new province found since the Second World War, and it contains about 60 billion barrels. This is enough to supply the world for three years. Even that was not all that much. So to imagine that there's anywhere mist as big as the North Sea is, is just implausible. Yes, there, there is time in principle. There is time for, for people to react to this situation, not only in their own lives, and I think that is how it will have to happen, that individual people will begin to understand. There will be a shift in the way people think, and that gradually will affect their governments and how the politicians react. I think there's little hope of the politicians taking the lead in this, because it's difficult in, 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 in government for people to... It's much easier for a politician to react to a crisis when it's happened than to take steps to prepare for one. That, that's difficult in, in politics. So the steps to go forward is for people to understand this subject better. It's not very difficult to understand. I, I recently gave a talk to a group of Irish uh, country ladies, they were called country women of West Cork. These were farmers' wives who had been brought up in a very rural situation. And surprisingly, I was asked to give this uh, talk, and I never met an audience who understood the question so readily and easily and was no surprise. So I think people can understand quite easily once even the minimal information is given, and that should lead to a new progression of, of government's reaction to better take care of the thing. Now, specifically, I've proposed a depletion protocol, which is worth talking about a little bit. The, the idea of this protocol would be that every country would cut its imports to match the world depletion rate depletion rate being annual production as a percent of what is left. And in a world scale, that is about 2.5%. So we would simply ask Switzerland, for example, to reduce its imports every year by 2.5%. We simply look out of the window and we see 100 cars go by every 10 minutes. We would say next year there would be 97. This is not a huge challenge. Switzerland could certainly be able to achieve such a thing given that they could see a purpose to do it. And so I think if, if this would be a practical step to change the mentality, change the attitude, and begin to bring in alternative energies to improve efficiency, get rid of waste, and begin to live in a realistic way in relation to the future. The countries that need oil will wish to take it uh, from where they can get it. And uh, this, can be, this can be marketed in many ways. You could say you are performing a service for humanity to protect oil supply, but at the same time making sure that you get what you need before anybody else. So the first, step, uh, first, uh, first possibility is some kind of wars or, 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 or geopolitical events of that kind in which the United States and China find themselves and competing with each other for the access to oil. Europe is a little bit behind because it has sort of preferential access to Russian oil, which will help for the next few years. So that's the first reaction. After that, I suppose we face, well, the most obvious thing is, is uh, the aviation business must begin to decline. Uh, people are not going to be able to, to, to fly around the world for holidays so easily. Look at crowded streets. This is a very inefficient way to use energy. We, we make fantastic cars with the most sophisticated technology. And what do we do with them? We have them sta stationary, blocked in traffic. So I think you face all of those kind of changes. And if you want to be positive about this, you could say that it actually leads to a better world. And people might find their lives rather better in a way. And it's not so evident, but it might be possible. Personally, I'm doubtful. I, I think we, we come to the end of this person called Homo sapiens. A hydrocarbon man, you could say, is, might be extinct this century. Well, he, not only can he, he will be extinct this century. Whether we have another species after hydrocarbon man is not so sure, but we can be optimistic. I sometimes think in terms of my grandchildren, for example, will they be thinking well of their grandfather if he uh, got rid of all the oil and left them nothing, you know? 
there's some French uh, philosopher or poet who says we don't inherit from our parents, we steal from our children. So the 